when you become aware of what it's like to be you moment to moment, you see that everything is just happening, right? mm -hmm. including your, your capacity for effort. All of that is part of the what's just happening mm -hmm. in the universe. It's not that you can't make choices, but again, the choices themselves are also just happening. How do we move on from the story or how do you do it? Do you live with a, a lot of worry each day or are you so good now at just saying, this doesn't matter, you know, this is in the past or I'm, I'm concerned about something that's not gonna happen potentially in the future, so let me get back to present. Like, how do you yeah. not worry? Well, so I mean, everything for me, sort of at my level of practice, and I've done a lot of meditation practice, but you know, there's there's apparently much more to do in my case. Because um, <laughs> you still worry. Yeah. Well, no. So I I, I can. I, I, there's there's no emotion that I don't experience, right? So I can I can experience you know intense anger, intense sadness, mm -hmm. depression, worry, all of it, um, and the difference for me, and this is something that that you know, I wouldn't have but for the fact that I've, I've really learned to, to practice mindfulness. The difference is when my suffering becomes at all intense, it functions as a kind of mindfulness alarm, right? Like, and so like the, the truly kind of mediocre path for me is to be within the range of sort of normal annoyance and normal desire. <laughs> Mid-level suffering. Yeah, where the alarm's <laughs> not going off right. and I'm just you know, uh, kind of a normal jerk, you know, within that, within those bounds, yeah. right? Like, you know. A little anxious here and there. Yeah, yeah so I, got, I go to the dry cleaner and, and discover that they, you know, destroyed my suit, right? It's like, so it's like this, this, in the scheme of things, it does not matter at all, right? But, but, but you're when, frustrated, you're yeah, annoying. Yeah, it's like, okay, what, what, are you, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, you know, so it's like, attention is captured, and when, when attention is captured by that, you know, I'm the same guy I always was. Right, right. right. Um, <laughs> You're always a jerk? Yeah, well, well just like whatever. It's like, I, or, or attention can be captured pleasantly by right, something right, that you're right, know, right. like, oh God, I mean, this is the best bagel I've ever had, right? So right. I'm like, I'm just going for the food and there's no perspective. You know, like I'm not, I'm not you know, uh, the, the consciousness is trimmed down to just the, the pleasure or pain of that experience for mm -hmm. that moment, right? Um, and that, all of those moments for me have the character of being, uh, they really are they're deeply analogous to being asleep and dreaming and not mm. knowing that you're dreaming. Mm. Right? So the reality is you're in your bed, you know, prone or, or supine, or you know, you're, you're just, you're, you're in a situation that's completely unlike the situation you think you're in. And you think you're on a beach, you know, talking to somebody or, you know, arguing with somebody. You showed up at a conference and, you, you know, you, you didn't have your pants, All you right. know, whatever, whatever it is. <laughs> and, um, you know, you're relating to people who don't exist, right? And, uh, I mean, just, I mean, we're psychotic when we're dreaming. Right. We're completely right. confused, right? Unless it's a lucid dream, right? Which is its own interesting yeah. experience. Um, but assuming your dreams are not lucid, you are... You are completely unaware of a larger con the, mm -hmm. the true larger context of your experience, yeah. and and you're merely hostage to whatever is playing out in that dream, yeah. right? You know, so and that and that most of experience that is mediated by thought, uh, and the, you know, apart from mindfulness, most experience has that character. So for me, once you turn up. The, the dial on intense the intensity of the experience it's your alarm, that, yeah. that, then I begin then then something else comes online for me more reliably um, uh, and uh, then you can you know if you really know how to meditate you can break the spell decisively Quick. in an instant yeah. you know, and and in that instant you are fr you you have woken up I mean mm -hmm. you're no longer in bed uh, asleep right and um, so I can do that. Uh, I mean, there's, there's sort of two. I mean, I guess there are two landmarks I would suggest to notice. I mean, if, if somebody's practicing meditation and they're and they're um, really getting into it, I would say that there are kind of two points that I, I would I would flag as points of real durable progress. The first is um, just to no, just to notice the difference between being lost in thought 
and clearly paying attention to experience, you know, prior to thought, prior mm -hmm. to concepts. Um, and so that's that's mind that's sort of small m mindfulness that that people learn, you know, once they they start a practice. Um, and that has the consequences of if you do that enough, if you keep if you keep punctuating your ordinary experience with that, just non-judgmental, non-reactive acceptance of what the present moment is, right? So you feel anxiety, you feel irritation, you become mindful, you just become interested in that feeling, in the in just the, the neurophysiology of it, the 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 sensation of it. You get out of your thinking about all the reasons why you should feel anxious or you should mm -hmm. should feel irritated. You just become merely present with the experience, and then you notice this kind of half life. It, it just dissipates, right? And that's um, there's a certain kind of freedom in that. Uh, there's another point which you know in my in my meditation app, I spent a lot of time trying to push people toward you know earlier than is is conventional. There's another point where you can you realize that the the feeling of self, the, the feeling that there's a subject in the center of experience is an illusion, right? Mm -hmm. that it's actually not there. If you, you can look for it deliberately enough. That we are an illusion. Yeah, it's not, it's not that your body is an illusion, it's not that people are illusions, but the, the sense that you have that you are a subject in your head, rock, kind of riding around in the body, like that you're, that they're, you're behind your face in this mm -hmm. moment. Like, like you and I are talking, I'm looking at you. The normal, the, the default situation is for you to feel implicated by my gaze. Like I'm, I'm, lo I'm looking at something. Like right. you're, you're on the <laughs> other side of my gaze. Right. right. I mean, my mind is, or my, my consciousness, well, whatever. Or, yeah. This is you. It's like, like I, like you're, you. There's something. You know, if, if you say something, and I'm, and I, you know, get a weird expression on my face, like I don't believe you or whatever. You, you can can read that back into it. it sort of. It, it, it falls back to you. It's like it points back to you. Like if I if I point at you, it feels like I'm pointing at something. I mean, this feels rude. Like this feels you know, this is normally a rude gesture, right? right? So it's like you feel like 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 you're, you're over there. Yeah, you're yeah. behind your face, right? Uh, you know, and that's that's what we call I. I mean, that's that, that's that the, when mm. the personal pronoun pronoun for most people refers to the feel that feeling of being in the head. It doesn't refer to the whole body. You know, it doesn't refer to, because um, people don't feel identical to their whole bodies. They feel like passengers mm -hmm. in their mm -hmm. bodies. They feel like subjects. They feel mm -hmm. like the, the center of experience. Um, and I mean, the real goal of meditation is to recognize that that is an illusory position. That's actually not your position. Mm -hmm. There really is just experience. There's there's just consciousness and its contents, and there's no center to it. And so at a certain point, mindfulness can become the experience of just cutting through that illusion, right? So you're not, it's not that you're having to be strategically mindful of anxiety or anything else that you may notice that you, you want to have dissipate. You suddenly recognize that there's just no center yeah. to experience. And then, then your meditation practice becomes recognizing that in each moment. Mm -hmm. And that has the, that has the, the consequence of just, I mean, that, that's synonymous with not being lost in thought in that moment. It's synonymous with not giving any more energy, therefore, to this reaction you're having. It's synonymous with no resistance to whatever is appearing, right? Mm -hmm. So you, so you're actually free, even before the physiology of the negative state dissipates. So I mean, let's say you're you're angry, you're feeling road rage, you recognize there's no center. Your your freedom in that moment isn't even contingent upon the anger going away. It's like, because anger at that moment is no longer anger. Anger is just, it's just tension, sure. you know, it's just tension in your face. You know, like you, you could have tension in your face because of, you had some dental procedure, right? But it's like, it, like it, it literally, it just completely disconnects the, this, this, the free, the, the sense of your own well-being and and expansiveness, because mm -hmm. again, the center has dropped out. There's just consciousness and its yeah. contents, right? And it do, it doesn't actually and and so that this is again, this can sound paradoxical, but then from that point of view, you know, the kind of experience I had on MDMA doesn't even improve the one situation. I mean, then because when there's just consciousness without a center. On some level, there's no. 
I mean, this is the the, the truth here that, that I'm alluding to. I mean, that the the jargon in Buddhism is is this, the truth of emptiness, right? Sure. Is, there's just there is no, there's nothing. Um, there is no thing, right? Everything everything is just. I mean, so to take to take an analogy of uh, that works for me. Um, have you ever gone to a restaurant where you have there's there's one wall that is a, a like a, a perfect and perfectly clean f- floor to ceiling mirror, and for most of the meal you're you've been assuming that the restaurant is twice the size big, that it yeah. actually is, right? So you're like there's a bunch of people over there that you just thought were people, but you know at, at some point in the meal you recognize oh, it's just half the size, yeah. right? And that's just glass and it's just a wall of light, right? It's an illusion. You know, yeah, 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 and so. That transition, where you like, like if someone just walks up and puts their hand on the glass, and 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 in that moment, all the stuff you thought was happening there, you know, you, someone could have been having an argument, right? Or like someone could, have, mm-hmm. you, someone could, you know, physically assault someone there. Now, forget it. This is where the analogy breaks down because you know there's something happening in the real world. Right, but yeah. but the. the what happens when you touch the mirror and equalize all of that is just a, a display of light. You, on some level, everything has become equalized. The, the, you know, the ugly things are the same as the beautiful things, right? There's just not, it's, it's, just, it's just light, yeah. you know? And so there, that, that's a good analogy for the freedom you can experience when, there's, when the illusoriness of the self drops out of consciousness. It's like for, for that moment, and it might only be a moment. I mean, so the, the course of practice, once you're able to practice in that way, is really just about punctuating your life with with brief moments of that you know like, you know a hundred moments like that yeah. over the course of a day or an hour right it's not about uh, at least not you know anytime soon for most of us it's not about spending an hour in that state right because mm-hmm. it, it, but being able to punctuate life with with that insight uh, it really does change the game because then in each one of those moments you realize you're you're not, life isn't about seeking to become happy, right? It's not like you, you can only be happy. You can only, you, you can only be free in this moment. It's, it's only, it's only ever this moment. Now, now, not so seeking for the future. You, what you have is this moment and then your thoughts about the past and the future. That's, that's always been true and that will always be true for as long as you have any experience at all. So, so it's, you're either, looking over the shoulder of this moment for what's coming, you know, worrying about it or, or greedily, you know, kind of reaching out to the thing you want. Um, and I mean, so, so much of life, you know, 99.9% of life for, for most of us is seeking certain experiences and getting them and feeling Kind of the briefest moment of gratification, that like we we, we we unite with the object of desire for the, I mean, a barely, yeah. barely a second, you know, yeah. and then uh, then we're on to the next thing, or then we're even I mean even the thing we desired, if it persisted longer, would become undesirable. I mean, just imagine like a, like you know you're going for the bowl of ice cream, you're you're, you're getting sort of the peak taste of it. Imagine if that taste never went away, right? Like that wouldn't, that's the pleasure, you know, that's not the pleasure you want. And that would be intolerable. I mean, you, mm-hmm. you'd, you'd go to a, a doctor. It's like, I, I had a bowl of chocolate ice cream last week and oh, I, can't I, get this, tro- I can't get this taste of chocolate <laughs> out of my mouth, right? I mean, so what, what happens is that you, you take a bite of ice cream that you thought you wanted more than anything in that moment, but actually it's a little too much. And then you, you, you reach for a glass of water and you, wash it out at a certain point, right? Like it's like it's right. not, um, you know, it, on some level, all of these uh, these things we want are a mirage, mm. right? You know, you get, you know, whatever it's like, like you, you wanted a new watch right. and you were like, you want, you want to be associated with this object and you went shopping for it and you finally got, it's like, this is exactly how I wanted it to look on my wrist and boy, am I happy with this. And then like, you know, you have these brief moments of interaction with it and, but, when you actually drill down on what the experience is like, I mean, the experience of being satisfied with with some something in sensory space, it is kind of paradoxical and yeah. and insubstantial. And the thing we actually want is 
a good enough excuse <clears throat> to totally relax into the present, like to 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 to, mm. to get rid to to fulfill the desire so that we're no we're no longer feel Anxious desire. Yeah, interesting. You want to be free of desire, right? Mm. You want to be free of all of your problems. You know, you want your to do list to be all checked off and then empty and. Um, uh, and then, and those become peak moments, right? So, like, it, but the, the problem is we associate the experience of completely dr- giving up the war and and being completely satisfied in the present. We the, the the brief moments we touch that, you know, and and you know, in positive psychology, many of these you know states are are called flow states. Um, those brief moments where we're just we're not worried about anything, right? We associate that with some you know, enormous effort we made to get here, right? And yet that is in fact the, the way consciousness already is if we can just pay attention to it. Mm. And that's why meditation becomes a kind of the ultimate hack of uh, in, in, in how one can pursue one's well-being because right. it's just it's just it's just true that, that that consciousness is that way, and yet we're spending all of our time seeking to have a good enough reason to realize that. Mm-hmm. It's like if I if I could just win the Nobel Prize, I'd feel good enough about myself uh, that I wouldn't feel like I would have to you know do anything. I could stop you know, everything else. Like, like, like just you know, I, this, there would be no. But then you egocentric, feel like, right. you know, grandiosity program that I would need to run because I'd have a Nobel Prize. But, the, but the then re- you'd be like, well, what's next? And the, how do I stay relevant? Uh, and, uh, that's exactly what happens to everyone who wins the Nobel Prize. What, what happens is I get depressed. So, someone says, what are you going to do next? Right. And, and you're like, I just won the Nobel Prize. Yeah, what yeah, else can I do? And it, so, so and the half life of those those peak experiences wow. is incre- incredibly short. You know, it's it's. It's, it's a moment. In, the, in the best case, it's it's days, right? But in yeah. reality, it's you know it's uh, it's unwinding you know, over the course of, of minutes. I remember right? my whole uh, childhood. I wanted to be an all-American athlete. It was right. like all I obsessed about. I cared about it deeply. I would sacrifice my life. I never had a sip of alcohol in right. high school or college. Because I was like, I'm going to do whatever it takes to be an all-American athlete. Right. Was it was football or football? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I didn't go partying. I didn't go do anything. Right. I was like, I'm not going to date girls. Whatever it takes, I will train in the morning, in the afternoon. No sugar, right. anything. Yeah. And I remember um, I did it in football and decathlon, but the first time it happened was in the decathlon. And I remember it was down to the last event in the decathlon. It's two-day event, ten events. And I had to beat, I knew exactly who I needed to beat in this 1500 mile, uh, 1500 race to get the eighth place. And eighth place was the cutoff uh-huh. for the All-America. So I was like, okay, it comes down to this event and I just got to do uh, something I've never done before to make it happen. All my life comes down to this moment, right? 22 yeah. years of existence, yeah. dreams, dedication, commitment, everything. And I go out and I run the race of my life. I beat this guy by like a couple of seconds and it was so close to see how many seconds I need to beat him. And they call my name as the, the eighth place. Mm-hmm. So I get the All-American, I get the trophy, I stand up on the thing in front of the whole stadium and I'm excited for literally maybe seven minutes, yeah, right. maybe 10 minutes. And right. then I was mad the whole dinner. Like uh-huh. I'm sitting there with my family, my parents are there, my teammates, everyone's celebrating me and I'm like angry. I don't want to talk to anyone. And I didn't understand why. And I think it was because I was so obsessed of reaching this moment that I was like, I don't feel like it's good enough for me. I only got eighth place all over right. it. And I yeah. didn't get number yeah. one, you know. Yeah. What am I going to do now? You, you move the goalpost, yeah. Yeah, and I was just like, well, what now? Like, I'm done with school. Now what do I do? Right. I've been chasing this thing for so long. What do I do now? Yeah. So how all, we... all the drugs and alcohol. The, the, <laughs> Everything I gave up right. for this. Yeah. I was like, uh, so how do we stay satisfied in an unsatisfied world? Well, that, I mean, that's the the false premise. I mean, this is why this is again. To, uh, you know, I don't I don't consider myself a Buddhist, and you know, in my meditation app, I'm not teaching Buddhism. But uh, you know, it's it's true that Buddhism has such a good handle on mm-hmm. this that it's it's easy to default to Buddhist language. So um, it's often said that you know the Buddha talked about life being suffering, and that's actually a mistranslation of what of the original Pali. The the, the term is dukkha. 
And the better translation is unsatisfying or unsatisfactory. And so not it, life is suffering, life is unsatisfactory. Yeah, yeah. So and it's unsatisfactory because the core reason is that whatever arises having arisen will of necessity pass away. Every, every, everything that is conditioned, every, you, have, you bring conditions together, uh, mental and physical conditions, and whatever has been, has been born of that assembly is impermanent, right? So, you, you, so, so the, I mean, in, in, to, to, to take your experience, you can only stand on that podium for so long, right? right? You know, a at, at a certain point, everyone who's who's been clapping will stop clapping and leave the room, right? Yeah. And the neurophysiology of yeah. elation, like, oh, you know, finally, I did it, I did it, I did it. like it's just to say, I did it. I, like you, you can only say that to yourself with the voice of your mind so many times, right? Before you sound psychotic, yeah. right? Um, and so everything has a, everything just dissipates. So you can't. I mean, it, it's it, experiences like that and every other. Is literally like trying to scoop up water in your hands, right? You can't hold on to it, uh, and so, so the, the Buddha was not denying that there are extraordinarily pleasant experiences in life. I mean, that's that's undeniable. But however pleasant they are, they pass away, and then there are unpleasant experiences that are that are bound to come, right? It's just like if you if you sit, no matter how comfortable you make your body. You know, this is a very comfortable chair. I can get, I could, you know, if given 10 minutes, I could right. get myself in precisely the right position here to be able to sit for as long as possible. But at a certain point, if I just don't move, I will begin to feel excruciating pain. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, and you can try this. I mean, just, just try to sit yeah. in the most comfortable position you can possibly find for four hours, right? At a certain point, you know, for most of us, well short of four hours, you will feel pains in your body that mm -hmm. are amazing. Same right. thing about like yeah. laying in the most comfortable bed. You yeah, know, yeah. For two days, yeah. you're you, gonna be like if you just sores. if you just don't move, if you just decide. I mean, the meditators do this, where they vow not to move for some period of time, uh, because it, it's incredibly instructive. I mean, what you, what happens is you 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 know sit as comfortably as you want, you feel pain. and then just don't move. <laughs> the pain comes, or the itch you know the itching comes, and. If you're not going to move and scratch, or you're not going to move and relieve the the pain that that has just you know been born like a you know a, a supernova in your knee, <clears throat> you what you'll then experience is, um, and this is why it's instructive because you can experience incredibly intense pain that you know conceptually can't be uh, really problematic. I mean, you're not getting injured. You're just sitting in a chair, right? So whatever you can experience there. Even if it is, you know, the worst pain you've ever felt, you know, if you just move, you're going to be fine, yeah. right? So, so what happens is, I mean, there are people who will sit for 12 hours, right? I mean, and um, you experience, I mean, you can experience. I mean, it can feel like someone has just driven a nail into your knee, or that you like just you just broke a vertebrae, right? Like I mean, just like <laughs> awful pain, right? But it becomes an amazing tool of concentration yeah. because it's impossible to ignore, right? So the, the, the problem with, with meditation for most people is that, or for everyone in the beginning, is that you're, you have so little concentration that you're just, you're, you're lost in thought perpetually. You're trying to follow the breath or you're trying to pay attention to sounds and you do that for a second or two and then you, you start thinking about, you know, I wonder, you know, how, how that interview went. Or, right. you know, and, uh, then, then you notice your thinking and you come back to the object of meditation. When you're feeling excruciating pain, it's very easy for attention to just dive into it and um, you can become fantastically concentrated. And, and concentration, uh, it just so happens, is intrinsically pleasurable. Mm -hmm. I mean, so much of what we like about you know, yeah. flow states and and or even just being lost in our work. I mean, these these, these satisfying moments of just be, of having of not being scattered at all and being totally focused on something. That the ple the pleasure component of that is really just the concentration. It yeah. doesn't matter what you're focused on. I mean, literally, if you can focus on the breath uh, to the exclusion of everything else for five minutes, that becomes like a like a drug experience. Yeah. I mean, and that's, you know, it, again, that's also a temporary experience. I mean, concentration is one, another one of these things where, you know, you create the conditions for it 
and those conditions are impermanent. And then you're, mm-hmm. you're so the, 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 the fundamental insight to have is that it's possible to recognize that consciousness itself is free of its contents, right. you know, and, and, and that's, that's really the purpose of, of meditation. And that's why it's an antidote to the normal uh, ordeal we experience of seeking satisfaction. I mean, you're talking about you're talking about a, sat- a, a an experience that lasted minutes that you spent years, years. even <laughs> even more than even decades right. seeking. You know, and um, so many. I mean, so so many people are living their lives with that framework. You know, acknowledged or not, we're 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 living with this this sense of uh, implicit in all of our efforts to become happy is this po- this prospect of finally arriving at right. something, and you never arrive, right? You can't you can't arrive until you can just drop your search, right? So it's like it's it's the search it's the search for happiness that is making us uncomfortable. It, it is it is the practice of being uncomfortable in each moment, right? And, and that, and, and we have to, meditation is just the, a technique, and the, again, there are many techni- techniques, sure. but at bottom, it's just uh, relinquishing that, that act yeah. of, of, of indulging the illusion that you, could, you would be happy if only, so if, if, only right. the, if only this cup were full of hot coffee, right? <laughs> then I would, right. you know, you be know happy. Then, yeah. Then I yeah. could relax. Right. I've got a, I've got a, a few more questions I want to sure. ask you. Are we still okay on time? Just mm-hmm. want to make sure I respect your time. This is fascinating, and um, I'm curious. When do you feel the most loved? When do I feel the most loved? Um, Well, it's interesting because you know there is a kind of transactional notion of love that most of us grow up with, which, again, I've I've sort of lost really since that time, that first MDMA trip. I mean, that, that, it could, because on some level, it's not about being loved, right? Like, I, I mean, I have you know, I have. I'm very lucky. I'm surrounded by people who love, who in fact love me, and they 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 successfully communicate that, and that's nice, right? But right. but the real <clears throat> satisfaction is feeling love. Well, like again, that's a state. Of being. It's not predicated on what the other person's doing. You know, so like I, I, parents. Um, I don't. Know, do, you, do you have kids? No. Yeah, okay. Okay. No. So this Call is an experience. Me, yeah. you, okay. This this will this awaits you. <laughs> you know, so much of parenting is not about getting the clear signal of love back, shining back at you from your kids, right? You can't wait for that to feel love for them, right? So, and so much of, so much of the experience of, of my feeling love for my kids happens when they're not especially happy, right? And so they're, or if they're happy, they're certainly not shining it back on me. I mean, they might be annoyed at me and that annoyance is just the most adorable thing in the world, right? right? It's like, 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 you know, I've got a five-year-old who's like, she, she can just, Whatever is going on with her, I mean, she can be. She, she's a little tyrant. I mean, sometimes I, it's like I'm, I'm living in North Korea with Kim Jong Un, <laughs> right? Like so, like you know, if, if she could have her way, you know, the whole cities would would burn. But she's so adorable, right? Yeah, and and yeah. so it's like so like and so that state of being <laughs> of just taking delight in the the her full range of experience, right? Um, that is. On some level, that's possible even with grown-ups who are unpleasant, right? right? Like you can just see, like on some level, you can, if you look out at the world, you can see that you are surrounded by um, people who are suffering, you know? Like so, like I mean, this is sort of the compassion side of the coin rather than the love. Like so, you know, love is. I view love as as having a few different modes. I mean, one is what it's like just just to have a fundamental good intention for, for other people and other sentient beings. And that, that's the state of love. Um, so what does that feel like in the state of other people's suffering? Well, that, that, it feels like compassion. I mean, you mm-hmm. just want, you just wish that they were no longer suffering and right. you, you wish you, there was something you could do to help. Um, uh, and what does it feel like in the state of other people's happiness, right? And that's, you know, the, the Buddhist term for that is sympathetic joy. It's like mm-hmm. you, you actually, 
you you take joy in their joy. It's like like the the feeling you feel like uh, you know if you see someone win, you know, uh, on American Idol or whatever. Right, like you see the you, like yeah. yeah, it's like like that feeling. Like you know you you can burst into tears of joy for that other person's joy, right? Um, now it's 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 used. I mean, this is a good corrective for where m- many people are at. I mean, just, just notice what it's like when someone cl- someone in your life. Uh, experiences some great success, right? And uh, you know it becomes p- p- potentially more uncomfortable if they if they do it in a zone where you are like like well, imagine you're trying to become the decathlete, right? And your best friend is, is also trying mm-hmm. to become a decathlete. He comes in first in that race, right. right? You know, like just how good do you feel for him, right? right. Now, um, that really is the limit of friendship. If what you feel is envy rather than joy in his joy right you're not a good friend mm-hmm. right like that like so like, like that's a boundary that you want to be able to blow past in yourself right um, so and, and love is pre- real love is the ability to do that I mean real love, real love is the antithesis of envy in that moment mm-hmm. I mean, you, like you like you you actually do want your friend to totally succeed to Even get what he wants. You. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's like 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 that. Like that's the person you want to be. Like you want mm-hmm. to be so stoked <clears throat> that your friend got what he wanted and was dreaming for that you are undiminished by it. Even when it's even when you guys are in the same lane, mm-hmm. right? Um, that's what it would. I mean, and again, that's that you know, given the right or the wrong arrangement there. That could be either harder or easier to do, but um, that's, I mean, ethically and emotionally, I think that's the goal, to, to be that right, kind of person, right. where it's like, you know, you want people's dreams to be realized, mm-hmm. and when they're realized, that becomes yet more reason for you to be happy. True. You know? So, but when do you feel the most loved, personally? Well, so, I mean, I mean you know, you know wrestling with my five-year-old or ten-year-old daughter I mean that's just awesome yeah I mean that's just yeah, that's the greatest fun you know I ever have in any given day I, I do Brazilian jiu-jitsu and, and so like I'm, I'm trying to teach them the, the rudiments of jiu-jitsu um, you know which uh, has the at this point the 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 routine is kind of like the, the the Peter Sellers movies where like you know Peter Sellers and Cato are constantly attacking each uh-huh. other you know uh, <laughs> surprise attacks uh, so that that's that goes fun. that goes down a lot. I mean, I, they're the very girly girls, but you know they they can unleash impressive violence <laughs> on them. So it's a it's a great counterpoint to that's all the, the princess stuff and you know, that's going on. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's just it's that's just pink, cool. and then and then it's just like a, you know, like a Quentin Tarantino. It's like Kill Bill, you know. <laughs> um, what's the lesson you want to teach your kids the most? If you could teach them one lesson, what would it be? Well, a lot of what we've been talking about is relevant there. I mean, just what, just what are the the real mechanics of of suffering and happiness? Um, so, the the power of mindfulness is is yeah. one. Uh, but, I mean, what what gets emphasized even more at this stage, and I think is even it's kind of the coarser grained corrective that that improves people's lives the most is just to value honesty uh, as a, as a the the most important foundation for ethics mm. and and relationships. I mean, so like when I when I was eighteen, I decided I, it was this was the, the most consequential course I took in college was was a course on just it was really it was a graduate seminar on whether it was ever ethical to lie, right? And everyone came into this course, you know, assuming that you know lying was sometimes a problem, and obviously you know if you're lying all the time, you're you're a sociopath, but but. It, I would say everyone comes into, into that course thinking, well, there's certain situations where you have to lie. I mean, we, we all know there are white lies and you, know, you, you want to spare people's feelings and you, like, mm-hmm. you, so you got some amount of lying is just Normal. essential for doing yeah. business, right? right. Um, and so the course became just a crucible for kind of pressure testing that assumption. And it was, t- it was taught by this, uh, I don't know if he still teaches it, but um, this wonderful professor at Stanford, uh, Ron Howard, um, and uh, I wrote a book, Lying, you know, a few years ago, based on on this course. But this course, since the day, since some day when I when I was eighteen, oh. uh, I recognized that basically I never wanted to lie again wow. under any circumstances. That wow. li- that lying was that occupied some point on the continuum of violence. Where it's like if I'm gonna if I'm gonna 
it's, if I'm in a situation where I have to decide whether to punch someone in the face, well then, okay, then lying is part of that right, you know, right, toolkit. Right. But, you know, it's really only in emergencies sure, where you would sure. even consider it because it, it, it is synonymous with a total breakdown of of rational cooperation and, and collaboration with another person. You're, not, you're, yeah. you're no longer treating somebody like a, a, a person who can be reasoned with or related to. You're treating them like some uh, uh, emergency that you mm-hmm. need to, to navigate around, right? And, um, and that's true even for white lies. So, so my book Lying gets into that and gets into wow. to white lies especially. So, so since you're 18, do you feel like you've lied at all? I have in a in a few cases, uh, kind of by accident, like right. like 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 We're intentionally trying to lie. Yeah, like I, you say something, and then you realize, okay, that wasn't quite true. Like mm-hmm. like that, you know, I right. sort of got the, 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 my my uh, there, there was some embellishment that, that came online, or something just came out, and then it just becomes too awkward right. to actually get to massage the truth. You know, it's like or it's, wow. it's just it's just too pedantic or too so, so sure. something. But like I'm only aware of having told. My ten-year-old daughter, one lie in her life, right? Like, like so, like. What was that? Are you allowed to share? Yeah, yeah. No, it's, I mean, it's a completely <laughs> ridiculous lie. But Santa um, Claus is real. Yeah, yeah. So, like, so they, uh, that, that's actually the most common question I get in response to this this paradigm. Yeah. That, like, well, what about Santa Claus? Yeah, the tooth so, fairy or whatever. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, and the answer there is that you, you know, Christmas can be. You, you don't have to lie to your kids to make Christmas fun, right? Uh-huh. Like, like, like. And notice you don't. You notice no one feels like you have to lie about Halloween to make it fun, uh-huh, right? right? No one says no. Those, these witches are real, right? Like uh, ghosts are. Real. <laughs> you don't have to do that. Like, uh, fiction is fun enough uh-huh, for kids that, true, that true. Uh, you can make Santa Claus fun. Uh, but so, what did you lie to her about? We were looking at a. Um, we had done like some kind of Google search. I mean, she was she was maybe six, right? So she had no under, she didn't even understand the the, the, the right. lie that I told. But we had done a Google search on something that was producing like medieval woodcuts of like you know like it was something about the Middle Ages or knights or or you know something. Mm-hmm. And um, a woodcut came up that was just one of these you know happily it was it was a woodcut, not a real image, but it was it was like, it was like one of these. 15th century woodcuts of you know someone being decapitated right during the, the Inquisition right you know, someone's head sure. is getting sawed off, and you know so I I you know swipe by that and and she says Daddy what was that, and so I, I pull it back, and I said well that that was a um, a very uh, ancient and uh, impractical form of surgery, right, right. Sure, and, and sure, like sure. I'm not even sure so so but like so I just she was not prepared for me to say right, like right. listen someone you know, got killed yeah, yeah there's yeah. circumstances where other people cut other people's heads off <laughs> you know. Uh, right. For for bad reasons, um, do you feel bad that you told the lie, or do you feel like that's a situation? Well, well, that's... well I just didn't. I wasn't. I didn't think on my feet quickly mm-hmm. enough. Gotcha, right? But gotcha. I mean, there. You know, I, there, there's a role for. So, kind of radical honesty doesn't entail. Um, isn't incompatible with with withholding certain mm-hmm. information. I mean, like you don't have to tell kids everything about right. what's going right. on. Like, right. by, you know. My daughters don't need to know exactly what ISIS was up to, and you right. know just how horrible all that was. It's like there's a time to tell them what you know what, what's sure. going on in the world. So, but the honest truth for my kids in, in those situations is the stuff you don't need to know. Yeah, of right? course. Like, like it's we'll like, tell you later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You'll le- you'll learn that later. You know, what's, you know what's interesting about this? You know, for the last six months, I've been thinking about honesty more than ever in my life. I feel like, you know, I've Cheated. I cheated almost all my way through school yeah. on quizzes and tests and homework right. out of necessity because I couldn't comprehend the information. And no matter how many tutors I had all through school, it's like it was survival for me. Now I'm right. not saying I'm proud of this. Yeah, yeah. I, I stole things that I lied about from stores right. when I was a kid. You know, for two years I had to steal every time I went to a store, mostly candy bars or whatever it would be, smaller things. But still, I stole things for couple of years. Right, right. Not proud of that. And li- would lie about it. And in relationships, intimate relationships, I remember wanting to tell the truth, but having these negative consequences when I would. And so I would start to have more white lies. Yeah. And I would never feel good about it. Yeah. Ever. Yeah. But I felt like it was more of a defense mechanism or a way to survive or whatever it may be. And I just started dating someone at the beginning of this year. And within the first few weeks of us dating, she said, I want you to promise me you'll always tell me the truth. And it was like I had a moment where I said, okay, uh, my condition from the past is most of my experiences, people can't handle the truth. 
in yeah. intimate relationships. And there's consequences when you tell the truth. There's reactions. There's, you know, all this energy that's, I don't want to feel. But I just said, okay, I'm going to say everything 100% true that happens from this moment out. Mm. And it's the most liberating thing. Yeah. To yeah. be able to say, okay, I'm telling you the truth about everything, no matter what. Yeah. And if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out between us or whatever. Or if you're going to react, but I'm going to be honest. And it just feels more at peace. Yeah, yeah. And, and then the, the the growth is in... I mean, the, the, it forces growth on you and other people sure. in, in surprising ways. I mean, so for instance, once you decide that you can't lie then you find then then that suddenly becomes a mirror held up to yourself then you you, you find out what kind of person you are right you're like yeah. I, if i'm not if i'm not going to how integrity am yeah, i yes yeah. like let's say like so why don't you want to go out with me right like if i if, if i if i don't have recourse to a lie right <laughs> well then i then i'm forced to both in some on some level articulate who i am yeah. to the other person yeah like you know you're too fat right Am I that kind of person, right? So like, like that, like you're forced to recognize just how deep that runs in yourself wow. if, if you're not going to lie, right? Um, and then, then you can, you know, then there's growth that happens in, in all of those areas. Yeah. Um, the, uh, I mean, so much of the notion of, of white lies is, is a matter of avoiding awkwardness. Sure. And, it's, and it's, it's just not... Avoiding pain, right? Or, yeah, yeah. But the... The, the thing that happens in relationship when you resolve not to lie is that, and, and then p- and people know this about you or discover this about you, is that then you become a refuge for people who actually want honest feedback. Mm-hmm. And, and, and they, they, they want to know, like, then they know you that lie. you're not going <laughs> to lie to them, right? So, like, so, and then when you tell them that you love something they did, like if someone hands you their novel and you say you love it, they know you're not bullshitting, them, right? Right. They really matter, and, and and I've had this. I've gone through this with so many people, where it's like they've shown me one thing, and I said, "Okay, well, you you, you want to know what I think about this?" And, and I, I tell them something they really felt like they didn't want to hear, sure. but they you know they recognized you know, on some level. I, I mean, on, on some you can always frame it as, "Listen, I mean, this is just my opinion. I'm not you know omniscient. One like, person, like, like yeah. yeah, it's like so. This is my. This is how your novel strikes me. Like, so it, it may have a different effect on other people, but you know, here's what I feel very strongly about. And then you you give them the download, and you know, certain people you'll discover actually didn't want feed, honest feedback, and they'll never they'll never give you <laughs> the novel you again. again, right? Which is fantastic, right? You don't want you, you don't want to hear from them uh, right. on that point. Um, but the people who do want honest feedback really appreciate it. Yeah. And then when they give you the other novel they wrote and you love it, mm-hmm. they know it's not bullshit. Yeah. And, that, and that's, you know, you become incredibly valuable creatively to that's people good. in that way. Yeah. What is the question that you wish you had the answer to? That you were like, this is a certain fact about this answer. Well, the, the deepest one is, is related <clears throat> to to what we were talking about earlier, just ex- exactly how is consciousness integrated with the physics of things? Mm-hmm. How does consciousness arise? You know, what's, what's the answer to the, you know, what's called in philosophy the mind-body problem? Um, that would be, you know, if there were if there were one scientific mystery I w- would want to solve, that would be it. Mm. And we talked about your parents briefly before we started on camera. I'm curious, mm-hmm. who was more influential in your life and what was the biggest lesson they taught you? Well, it was definitely my mom. My mom raised me essentially as a, a single mom. My dad left when I was two and a half. Mm-hmm. And um, I had a relationship with him until he died when I was 17, but it was a long distance one. He, he moved to New York. And so it was, you know, that was, uh, um, it was interesting. Like I, I didn't really see the implications of all of that until I became a dad. And like, I mean, I didn't just how... Yeah you know, aberrant that was to just leave it to it. Like I, at a certain point I had a two and a half year old daughter and I thought, you know, what kind of guy would I need to be to leave now and move 3000 miles away and, wow. you know, have the level of involvement my dad had with me. So, um, you know, through my, my kind of my child's eye view of him, I didn't really see the problem. I kind of, you know, just you know, on some level, I probably thought I was the problem. Right. But mm. like, it was just, it was not, uh, you know, 
once I had a kid, I realized not only would, was that unthinkable for me, like I don't think I mean I know of I know people of you know varying quality in my life. I don't I don't think I know a dad who would do that, right? Like yeah. I, like I mean it was it was just very it was, it was a very strange epiphany to be able to you know, triangulate on on him in that way. So it was definitely my mom. Um, and what was the lesson the the greatest lesson she's taught you? That's it's hard to say. I mean she's you know we we've been you know, best friends for for so much of my life. Um, you know, I think my love of books and my love of writing and like that, that all of that got set by her. I mean, she was somebody who was a big reader and, and just loved, you know, I grew up with, you know, like the television in the living room just had books. It was like a wall of books all around it. It was like a, the television just set in books. And I remember, you know, from a very early age, you know, from you know, age five, I remember just like, you know, there's just, there are books everywhere. Mm. And, um, uh, and she's a great sense of humor. So it's like, insofar as finding the, finding the funny in things, you know, that, you know, uh, that's a corrective for, for yeah. almost everything. And that's, yeah. that's, that's where, cool. where she lives. You know? What's the greatest lesson your dad taught you in his absence? Um, or maybe that you well, learned. He, I remember he absence. explicitly taught me a lesson. Uh, it's funny, this is, this is, I don't know how old I was, but I remember he expli- you know, I mean, I think I, you know, I, I was always somewhat shy, I think. I mean, I definitely default to shyness. I'm, mm-hmm. like, I'm more of an introvert than an extrovert. Mm-hmm. And I th- at one point, uh, I think he must have noticed this about me. And he, um, he said, when you meet somebody, I, I want you to notice whether they go to shake your hand first or you go to shake their hand first. And I, I realized like that was, it wasn't just about that. He was like, like that, like that way of thinking about just, just being conscious of how I was relating to people was something that had never occurred to me at that point in my life. Like, wow. I, like I just, uh, um, again, I might've been, you know, it's 10 years old or something, but wow. like, like it, it realized like that was like a, a new piece of software that I, you know, I could have that, you know, I didn't even know was possible. Like, oh, yeah. like, oh, you can actually change this sort of thing about yourself. Like you can, this, yeah, yeah. And, and this, this might matter. So, um, so yeah, I remember him, you know, yeah. consciously trying to impart that lesson. What's the lesson you wish he would have taught you? Well, I mean, it would re- it's really just, uh, oh, I mean, the truth is I'm not even sure I mean, so he died when I was 17, so I didn't really have a fully adult relationship with him. Like, I, right. I, and, and, and this was, strangely, this, this, so everything we've been talking about in terms of like what I've realized in my life that's of value, you know, like you know, kind of the wisdom component of life, mm-hmm. um, and really most of my intellectual interests, all of that came online when I was 18. You know, he wow. died when I was 17. So like, mm-hmm. th- there's a, an amazing bifurcation in my life between you know who I am and have become and who I was when when you know when I had a father, so I and I have no idea hmm. how, what he would have thought about any of this or what he would have been like to interact with you know, about wow. any of this. So like I, I don't know how wise he was or wasn't. You know, it's very um, uh, it's interesting. It's just like uh, again, I mean the le- the lesson there you know that he teaches me in my absence in, in his absence is that that you know. There's, everything's in You don't know how long anything's going to last, right? You don't know right. when the last, when it will be the last time you are seeing a person, right? And, wow. and like, well, so what's the quality of that interaction? What haven't you said to the people you care right. about, you know? So, um, I mean, he was a very loving guy. I mean, it was not, there was like a, a circumstance of zero conflict, but it was just, um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's odd to consider the life choices he made you know, mm-hmm. as a father. Uh, Do you think you would be where you are today without his death as, you know, successful and pursuing the questions and the work and the, the mission that you have if he was at home with you when you were a child yeah, yeah, and supporting you, know, you the I don't whole know. time? Yeah, I don't know. Um, I mean, death has been... A very important part of my life. I mean, really? like my best friend died when I was when we were both thirteen. Wow. So, um, 
and that was a, like as, as far as an experience of death, like kind of the, the kind of the rude, you know, interruption in one's otherwise carefree life. It wasn't kind. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, like that was like the fact that that was on the menu. You know, that your 13-year-old friend can just die and disappear. Um, that was the that was the biggest shock for, with respect to people you know, close mm-hmm. to me who have died. You know, other people have died since, but. Um, and that, you know, so from when I was 13 on, I was somebody who's th- who had kind of big picture philosophical concerns about, you know, what does it all mean? And, you know, what's, you know, what is, what does it mean to die? And mm. what happens after death? And so that, like, I was, um, um, I mean, when I was 18, I had, you know, certain experiences that really uh, answered some of those concerns. But the, you know, I was thinking about issues of life and death from kind of 13 on, and that that's been super. Wow. And then so when my dad died when when I was 17, and he, you know he had had cancer for well, you know the better part of two years before that, so I kind of saw that whole process. And so that was um, yeah, I mean it was it's sobering, you know, mm. like it, you, you realize that the, it's it's good to. Um, Get your head straight about things sooner rather than later, and, and mm. so I, I've always, uh, you know, it, it has. I'm I'm always amazed to meet people who don't think about death at all, like and do their best not to think about death and yeah. succeed, right? So whether it's just like they're just living their lives, it's just the goal is to have as much fun and have as much success and mm-hmm. just keep it all positive, and. Um, because they 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 seem to think that the the alternative is to be made morbid by death right or to become a kind of you know Woody Allen character who's just tor- neurotic and tortured by one's concern about right, death right, right. Um, whereas there's there's a th- kind of a third channel to be on which is it, it can actually be a, the a primary source of wisdom it's like it, like it, it's massively clarifying to realize mm-hmm. that you know you've only got a certain number of days Right and 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 so like how how just how do you want to live in each moment yeah. and um, uh, you know just how trivial do you want to be you know how long do you how long do you want to suffer over this thing that you know is not going to matter not only, but certainly not going to matter on your deathbed it's not even going to matter two moment. days from yeah, now yeah, yeah. right like like it's like and yet now it's it's the thing that you're completely buried in obsessed right? with yeah yeah what's the thing you're most proud of that you've done in your life that you wish your dad would have seen or know about? It's funny. So many of these words don't land on the right shelf. For, no like, 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 like proud. Yeah. Proud doesn't really so say, I'm very in touch with the fact that, I don't know if you've heard my argument against free will, but like, mm-hmm. I, I don't actually feel personally responsible for uh, the, the good things that, that have uh-huh. happened in my life that I've done. Like, like, cause I, like, I just, I'm very, it's very salient to me that I didn't make myself, mm-hmm. right? I can't take any deep responsibility for who, for the tools I have or don't have, mm-hmm. that the level of effort I can exert or not, um, the priorities I have or, you know, lose sight of and then find again. I mean, like all of this, when you become aware of uh, what it's like to be you moment to moment, you see that everything is just happening, right? Mm-hmm. Including your, your capacity for effort, you know, the, the, including the, 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 the days you set an alarm and wake up early, the days you hit the snooze button once and the days you hit the snooze button five times, like, like all of, all of that is part of the, what's just happening mm-hmm. in the universe. Right. And, and it's not that you can't make choices, but again, the choices themselves are also just happening. And so, when I look at what I've done that strikes me as good, that you know, if, I, if given a chance, I would have done that again, right? Um, what I see is a lot of good luck, right? Mm-hmm. Like I'm lucky <clears throat> to have right. had, you right. know, the, the 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 capacity to do those things, you know, to and to, or to have developed it, and I'm lucky to be born in, into a society where I don't have to worry about all the things that you know someone in Syria has to worry about right now. You know, I can't take any responsibility for the fact that I wasn't born in Syria. You know, yeah. in, in a civil war, um, and so I just see like I just see that I have all of these opportunities that I've been able to make 
much of, but you know, not every. And I can I can't account for why I haven't been able to make more of, mm. of them, right? So like, mm-hmm. so so I don't feel like. I mean, the, the the flip side of pride is you know shame or mm-hmm. you know, self reproach or some you know that some uh, a corollary negative state. Um, I don't spend a lot of time on that either. You yeah. know, so um, so yeah, I'm very you know things are More things neutral, are yeah. things are going well, and I'm I'm very grateful for the the opportunities I have to to um, deal with interesting ideas and meet interesting people and, cool. and you know add value to people's lives and, and be surrounded by people who are adding value to mine. That's great. So. This is a question I ask everyone at the end. It's called the three truths. Mm-hmm. So imagine it is your last day, uh, as many years away as you want it to be. You can be 500 years old, 100 years old, whatever it is, right. it's your last day. You gotta go. Yeah. It's time to die. You get to have the situation you want it to be. You've got your family surrounding you. It's the the good way of dying, I guess, if we mm-hmm. want to call it that. And you've accomplished the things you want to accomplish. You've said the things you needed to say, written the books, you know, people admire you. Whatever you want, mm-hmm. it happened. Um, but for whatever reason, you can only share three final things you know to be true about all of your existence, your life. Uh, and everything that you've created has to go with you, hypothetically. So no one has access to your podcast or your app or your books right. or right. anything like that. But you get to write down on a piece of paper and share your f- three final truths, mm. the lessons you would leave behind to humanity. What would you say are your three truths? Well, we've covered that. We've actually been talking about them more or less this whole time. I mean, uh-huh. the, 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 the core is, uh, the first one is that there is just consciousness and its contents. You know the, that it's uh, and you know the, the implica the implication that all of that has for well-being, right? Like this is just you know it's a kind of an admonition to look more deeply into that fact, mm-hmm. right? Because of all the good things that that come and all the bad things that stop happening once right. you do that. Um, so that's one. That's one. So that's the that's the kind of the contemplative well-being side of it. Um, then there's the uh, uh, you know I guess I could put it in the form of a question. You know why would you ever lie? And that's the ethical side of it. You know that 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 sorts out one's relationships. Hmm. You know once you seize the whole seize hold of that all the people you shouldn't be spending time with kind of magically disappear and wow. all the people who want to have an honest relationship with you are, are there and appreciate your honesty. That's great. Um, the third one, I guess I, uh, the third one would, would should address kind of more, you know, society, like how, how do we, how do we organize society in a way that um, makes sense? Um, yeah, this this uh, this isn't poetry, but the the, uh, the, the <laughs> it's your last it, truth, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. This is this is, this is all the, the world the, knows you by. Th- this is this is an ugly last truth, but it <laughs> but it's nonetheless consequential. I, I think um, incentives are everything at the level of society. It's like what we want uh, is. To organize society in such a way where ordinary, neurotic, selfish people are incentivized to behave better and better toward one another. I mean, that mm-hmm. that's how we built this thing to really be a kind of utopia. Where like mm-hmm. it can't be it can't be dependent on everyone becoming a saint or or even especially wise. It has we we need to incentivize the things we want to see happen it, that in a way that takes out the friction. Yeah. Uh, and so much of what we see in the world that is creating needless human misery is a matter of incentives being badly aligned so that you have good people doing mm-hmm. horrific things just because <clears throat> they're incentivized to, to live that way, you know, and uh, they're not incentivized to do uh, yeah. the alternative. So, yeah. yeah. Those are great so, truths. So I yeah. love it. Um, <clears throat> you've got the Making Sense podcast. You've got the Waking Up app, which mm-hmm. everyone should get on on their their phone, the App Store. Um, where else can we connect with you? What else can we do to support you in your mission? 
Well, those are the two main places. I mean, it's all samharris.org is my website. So if, mm -hmm. you, if you want to know more about what I'm doing or like a calendar of live events or anything like that, that's that's always there. You're touring, you're speaking. Occasionally. I mean, it's not, yeah. not much on the calendar at the moment, but um, I've got an event uh, in L.A. at the Wiltern on July 11th. I don't know when this is going to come out, but yeah. that, that's, that's happening then. But um, yeah, I'm trying to keep the calendar a little clear at the moment, but... Um, yeah, everything everything gets uh, eventually announced on my website or on my podcast cool. yeah. or in the app. So you're on Instagram, Twitter, everywhere. I'm I'm, mo I'm for better and worse. I'm on Twitter. <laughs> I see uh, a lot of your tweets. I like yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. The, the tweets can be brutal. You got great uh, opinions. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm I, I'm less on Twitter, but Twitter is the only one I really engage okay. with personally. I mean, we 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 put stuff out in a everywhere, perfunctory everywhere. way everywhere Twitter else, is where you go on. Yeah, that's here. me on Twitter. Yeah. That's your opinion. Yeah, for, be for better and worse. So. <laughs> I like it. So make sure you guys check out the Making Sense podcast. That's about once a week on average. Yeah. Yeah, a couple yeah. times. Uh, Waking Up app, I highly recommend it. It's really powerful what you've done there. So congrats on that. Cool. I know it's been helping tens of thousands of people who've been using it already. Um, if not more, maybe right now. But um, congrats on that. Uh, I want to acknowledge you for a moment, Sam, for your wisdom and your intellect and your ability to dive into topics that are very controversial for people who have set beliefs that yeah, don't want right. to look deeper into another option or another way. And you continue to uh, research, dive in, test, analyze ideas, thoughts, and beliefs that can hopefully end, more, uh, end suffering for a lot of people or support people in less suffering to live a happier life and bring more peace to their hearts. So I acknowledge you for yeah, well, your gift, even though you say that everything is, you know, you're lucky and situations, but you've decided to continue to make the choices to serve people in this way. And I acknowledge that. Cool. Well, well thank you. Thank of you course, for listening. Of yeah. course. The final question is, what's your definition of greatness? Definition of greatness. Well, I mean, there's really there's really two. It's, um, I mean, that, you know, the conventional one of you know, whatever your whatever your goal is to be able to meet that most efficiently, mm -hmm. right? I mean, so there's there's greatness in so many areas of our lives. Um, so the but but I mean, beauty is an elegance. As variables uh, are, are we we recognize greatness when when those are also maximized, mm -hmm. right? So it's mm -hmm. like it's a sort of it's a, how you arrive at something matters as well. It's not it's just not that you arrive. Right. Um, so um, yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, you know, I mean, real, real greatness is a matter of meeting worthy goals and that you know that has the well-being well-being and ethical component to it uh, as elegantly as possible mm, there you go uh, sam harris thanks man yeah, appreciate yeah, it pleasure appreciate yeah. it man